Good morning, everyone. Thank you for showing up so, so early in the morning. You, you have to, of course. Um, you are uh, halfway almost uh, through the school, and um, I've really enjoyed myself. It's the second year I'm invited to come here and uh, be part of the full program, and, um, and it's really a, an honor um, to do so. So before I jump into there, um, just want to tell you about myself. Yeah, my name is Pietro, as you heard. Uh, I studied physics here in Italy, in Milan, and then I went to do my PhD in Cambridge in uh, 2000. And, um, and I stayed in, in, uh, in Cambridge ever since. In fact, I was very lucky with my career. I'll talk about my career, I think, on Monday a bit more. But I was very lucky, and uh, I always had job opportunities, and my group grew and grew and grew. And uh, now I have a group of about 20 people, and we work on uh, four topics, of which this one is the fourth. So I'll just uh, spend two seconds telling you about the other ones. So the biggest topic we have in the group is understanding how systems of motile cilia that we humans and all the mammals uh, have in the airways and in the brains and in fallopian tubes um, uh, covering tissues and, and beating and moving liquid, how, how these cilia synchronize together in order to make the nice Mexican wave uh, kind of motion that, that you saw on, uh, in uh, Eva's talk yesterday, uh, like people at the stadium. And that, 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 that delivers fluids to, to where we need it. So, so this is a big project. The, these, these fantastic structures are shared all the way from humans down to um, eukaryotic algae. And um, the, the molecular structure is the same. And also how they interact is, is quite a universal property. So there's a lot of physics as well as biology and that kind of problem. Then uh, we also have a big project on looking at um, lipid membranes. These are kind of important constituents of, uh, of cells and of life. So very thin membranes, floppy. They, they, they have a lot of physics that comes from, uh, from soft matter physics. And, and we're looking at when you make a mixture of lipids, uh, there are situations where phase separation happens. And here, here it's very interesting to me because there's, a, there's important biological questions about how this phase separation affects proteins on the membrane. But there's also a lot of physics that comes from the whole body of critical phenomena. And so you can actually get the phases of two-dimensional phase transitions imaged in the microscope uh, very easily. And, and the third big project that we have funded is, uh, is actually probably the most biological one. We, we look at bacteria, like E. coli. These are organisms that are models in biology. A, a, a huge amount of information is known on the genetics and on the proteins and uh, on the processes that go on here. But, but again, the biologists don't know physics. And so there's an opportunity for physicists to go and see whether there's anything that they know that can be applied in biology. And the particular question we have here is whether the, the chromosome, which is uh, the DNA that carries the genetic sequence, um, it, being a polymer, a double-stranded DNA, whether any of the polymer properties that we know from polymer physics uh, have it, any influence on the biological processes. And just to cut a long story short, if that polymer is very condensed and, and stuck together, then it's more difficult uh, for, uh, for the machinery that has to make the proteins to, to read out the sequence, uh, turn it into RNA, and then from RNA into proteins. So, so we're asking polymer physics questions uh, about the conformation of the polymer inside bacteria, and that involves experiments and, and polymer models. So, so, so these are three projects on which I will say nothing more, but, but from looking at your posters, a few of you are working on chromosome confirmation, some of you uh, are soft matter um, people, and a lot of you are nonlinear dynamics people. In fact, this is why I met Harry a few years ago at a workshop and uh, how I ended up being here because of this problem in my lab. But the project today on which I'll spend the rest of my time is project number four, so it's the baby project on which I have no money, uh, but I like it a lot, and uh, I will talk about this one. Um, so what does it mean, host pathogen interactions? It means um, looking at a system where there's a, a parasite infecting a cell. And uh, the particular uh, example I will talk about today is, um, is, in, is involving the disease of malaria. To be more specific, the, the, there's many uh, species of malaria. One of them is the deadly one for humans. It's called uh, Plasmodium falciparum. And it's a fantastic organism in a way because um, it has a very complicated life cycle. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And, uh, and there's a stage in which it infects our uh, red blood cells of humans. And it, that's the stage that carries uh, the symptoms and, uh, and often the mortality. 
so and it's also a stage that we, we can uh, look at in the lab. Um, a lot of what I'll tell you is the work of uh, Alex Crick, who f finished his PhD with me last year, and uh, and there's a second PhD who took on from him, uh, Yen Chun, but uh, I'll just tell you what she's doing at the very end. There's no data from her yet. And uh, I should also mention Yuri Kota, who's been uh, for many years a postdoc with me and has built uh, a lot of the fantastic instruments that allow um, across across all the projects in my group that allow people to, to do good experiments. We have collaborations with biologists, so even though we're not actually funded to do this thing, we're networked with people who are, uh, and that's really essential. There's a, this group is a, a cell biology group looking at malaria, and this group at the Wellcome Trust, Sanger, which is a fantastic campus outside Cambridge uh, where a lot of the human genome was sequ sequenced. This is a more, a more genetics group with uh, expertise in, uh, in that side of, of the biological question. So I have two take-home messages from my talk. I, I want to tell you about a bit of the science, um, but also uh, I will have a second theme that I will try to carry along, which is um, how, how, why I'm actually working on this question, and, and perhaps this can challenge you to think about how you choose uh, your search questions in your various stages of career. You actually have to choose uh, who you work with and what you do. Okay, back to malaria. It's, it's, um, it's a huge... Uh, problem worldwide. It, it's a disease that is present in all of these uh, shaded countries. And the color of this shading is actually representing um, drug resistance, emergence of drug resistance strains. So the dark brown are areas where there is a drug resistance, drug resistance malaria. So a huge number of people die from the disease, and, and these are actually mostly children. If you, if you survive through childhood in a, in a malaria um, um, infested region, then, then you probably live forever, but still, many of you will know much better than me, uh, it will still give you very kind of strong flu-like symptoms, uh, perhaps, perhaps annually. So even though an adult will probably not die, that there's still a, a huge economic burden. Uh, and people have estimated how much this disease uh, costs to the economy of, of countries where, where malaria is endemic in, in, uh, in regions. Uh, these are things that some of you do come from these countries and, and you will actually know firsthand uh, what's going on. Um, it was a disease that was also present in, uh, in the southern United States and, and uh, in places like Italy uh, until just a generation of, say, my, my grandparents. Uh, and it was eradicated mostly by using DDT with, with, uh, without the consequences. Um, okay, so in terms of kind of having a vaccine or a drug, um, it's a disease uh, that has uh, escaped, uh, um, escaped efforts so far to, to a large extent. And I'll try to explain why uh, as we go along. Um, if you just kind of forget about all the problems it causes and just look at it in terms of biology, it's actually, you can think of it as a, as a quite fantastic uh, organism. Um, it's a bit like a, a frog that has a, a tadpole stage and then becomes a frog frog. And, and the two don't look anything like each other. This, this organism actually has three stages that don't look at all like each other. So, so somehow the information in the genome codes for three very different forms of life uh, for, for the same organism. So you're familiar with the fact that uh, mosquitoes have to bite you uh, in order to, to get malaria. Uh, so there's a, there's a stage of the disease which, uh, which is in, inside the mosquito. So that, that's this stage. That stage is sexual, so there's a male and a female uh, parasite, and, uh, and th they live in the mosquito gut. Then the mosquito bites um, a human and, uh, and introduces uh, w one form of the organism into, um, into the blood, and that parasite goes into the liver, where, where it survives as a liver stage. And it's actually a motile parasite at that stage in the liver. From the liver, it's expelled into the blood, in a different form called merozolite, and this is the form that uh, we can study in the lab most easily. And, and it's, uh, it, it, in the blood, it uh, inserts itself into red blood cells where it digests hemoglobin and just amplifies its number. So from one parasite entering one blood cell, after 48 hours, there are about 20 parasites. They're all clones, identical clones, and there's no male and female at that stage. And then that cell bursts and releases 20 parasites into the blood. And the cycle starts again. For each one of those with a, quite a high probability uh, becomes 20 after another 48 hours. 
This goes on uh, repeatedly until there are millions and millions of parasites in the blood, and a large fraction of the red blood cells are infected. And this is the cause of anemia. So, so uh, people who have that stage of the disease um, uh, suffer from the symptoms of, uh, of not carrying enough oxygen and, uh, and carbon dioxide in the blood. And also, these infected cells are stiff, and they can clog capillaries. And that's one of the major sources of mortality, is, is the fact that people get hemorrhages um, in the brain or, or elsewhere where, where capillaries have become blocked. So the, the, the parasite itself is, of course, not trying on purpose to kill people. And for, from the parasites, evolution and, um, and livelihood it would be much better not to kill anyone. But th there's a balance, and, and, and uh, some people do die. Um, so we want to understand this cycle because if, you, if you're thinking of giving people a vaccine or stimulating the immune system to do something or giving a drug once the parasite is already there, uh, uh, targeting the blood stage is, uh, is the most obvious uh, place. It's more difficult to target liver. You can target the mosquito, I mean, and there's also programs actually addressing the mosquito. Um, either uh, by really er eradicating it with, with anti-pesticides or, or putting fish in ponds where the mosquito lay, lay eggs uh, or, or even very simple things like mosquito nets. And in fact, big funders like Gates Foundation are now, have switched completely from, from trying to target and understand the biology to very practical uh, programs of mosquito nets. This is a problem for us trying to understand the biology. Um, Okay, um, why is the blood stage still so poorly understood despite this disease being known to doctors uh, for, I think, over 100 years? Uh, well, the problem with the blood stage is that nobody really has good data on, on how this, uh, this amplification process goes on. E even though if, if you take red blood cells from a person, you put them under the microscope, you keep them at the right temperature and, and, uh, and, uh, and pH, etc., the, and you put some parasites, the, the, the thing will actually happen under your eyes. But it will happen so slowly, so the cycle for each cell is 48 hours, and yet so fast, because the important part is when the, when the parasites come out and infect here, and this part is less than a minute, that the combination is, is quite, quite dramatic. And, and, um, and until this, a paper this year, and one paper a few years ago, and our own paper last year, these three papers are the only ones with uh, some video collections of, of what's actually going on here. And, uh, and until you have sufficient data, you, you can't really tell precisely the, the sequence of events, how these parasites make their way through the membrane out, and perhaps even more importantly, how they make their way in uh, a new cell, how they stick and how, how they get in, and with what probability each of these things is happening, and how uh, each drug that you might want to test uh, affects the various, uh, the various aspects. I should probably say the traditional drugs, um, uh, like quinine and, uh, and things related to that, uh, target the, the digestion of hemoglobin by, by the parasite. But parasites, uh, the drug-resistant ones, have become capable of, uh, of not being blocked by, by that whole family of drugs. So, so it's not sufficient anymore to try to stop the, the growth inside the cell. And, and we hope there's, there's some scope to either target aggress, so the, the chance of getting out, or invasion, the chance of getting in uh, a new cell here. Okay, so our first uh, idea was, um, was, well, there's a challenge of image analysis. There, there, are, there are all these cells in, in cell culture, and, uh, and the biggest problem is that you don't want to keep a student for 48 hours to see a single event and then another 48 hours to see another event, because the, their PhD will be over before enough events uh, have been measured. Um, and the PhD might, student might not be happy anyway during that time. So, so you've heard a lot about image analysis at this hands-on meeting. So we did some very simple image analysis. Basically, the cells, uh, once they're infected, they are, uh, they're about 8 microns in diameter. So they're, they're not terribly small. And they look quite round. So, so we, you can do things like uh, Hopf transforms or very simple filtering to, to actually find the infected cells. You, you can even distinguish the infected from the non-infected, because the non-infected, um, I have other images later, but they're, they're not as uh, circular as these things, and they are a little bit bigger. So these become, they, they projected, they look a bit smaller because they're a bit more spherical. And essentially, you, you can find these ones. They also, 
uh, once they're mature, they have this uh, black spot, which is a crystal of the digested hemoglobin, so that, which is another thing that you can target uh, by image analysis. So, so you can run uh, kind of the microscope, and you can scan around, and you can record uh, where, where the positions of these cells. Because they're quite big, eight microns, they don't actually move about, not very much. So you can, you can also look at various fields of view, go back, and uh, there's a good chance that you will find yeah, your favorite cell again. So you can actually monitor uh, quite a few. And you, can, and you can definitely, from the image, tell when the cell bursts because it completely changes its size. So, so we, had some, we, we wrote some very simple filters to, <coughs> to, to uh, get the microscope to reliably uh, understand uh, when aggress was taking place. And that gave us a collection of about 100 movies in, in, in not a very long time uh, about, um, about, about aggress. So, so these two are just uh, two sequences over, over time. So this is, the cell, this is one cell just, uh, I've called it time zero, which is just the moment of where the first parasite is about to come out. And then we took with a, in bright field, so it's not very difficult to take frames um, um, hundreds, uh, hundred times per second. Uh, you can see a uh, first parasite popping out. After two hundredth of a second, it's gone a little bit further away. Then a second parasite uh, is ejected after the first one, and a third, and then after a few are ejected as single events, um, the, the membrane curls back, and the whole bunch uh, is out. Um, and and there's a paper by a French group in Montpellier on, 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 uh, on the mechanics of the membrane turning back and, and how that actually contributes to pushing out parasites. So, so that's us. This, is, this egress is quite, quite an interesting phenomenon from, from the physics and mechanics uh, uh, as well. Biologically, it involves digesting various membranes. So there's a sequence of, um, of events where, where the parasites uh, release specific proteins, which in biology are called enzymes if they have a function. So specific enzymes that digest uh, the, the two membranes. There's a membrane that holds the parasites, and then there's the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell, and then there's this phospholipid uh, layer of the red blood cells. It's, those three uh, have to be taken care of in order to get a parasite out. This is another uh, egress that uh, is more kind of... Uh, so this, this is the kind of phenotype. So phenotype in biology just means um, the appearance when, when, you, when you make a, a good description, you call it, this is a phenotype. This is the phenotype described by the French group a few years ago. Uh, it's not universal. Sometimes you get um, uh, an aggression phenotype that looks very different with uh, just uh, clumps uh, uh, and, and, never, and not the, kind of the single guys um, shot out. You can particle track these, uh, these merosolites. They are about one micron in size. They, in, in, with our resolution, they, they, you see them as um, essentially little spheres, but actually they're more like pairs. They, they have a, a head, a, an apical point, and uh, that apical point uh, is important because to invade, it has to touch the red blood cell. It's not enough for, uh, say, the bottom of the pair to touch the cell. It's actually got to turn around. And um, so we, we've, we've been doing some, some tracking to understand how that process of turning happens and whether it's purely, <coughs> purely random or, uh, or if it's driven. And uh, we didn't really manage to conclude anything from our videos, but in the meantime, a German team did simulations of, uh, of uh, pair-like uh, objects touching soft membranes, and, uh, and they, they decided that the fact that it's a pair uh, is important, so the, the, so the shape is important, and also that they think there's a, there's a gradient of uh, stickiness from the nose, from the top of the pair to the bottom, and so, so that when, when this object is doing its random motion on a membrane, it's actually driven towards uh, turning with uh, the pointy side towards the membrane. So, so that exists as a, as a result from simulations, and it, it, uh, we're trying to do experiments where we can uh, resolve the tip of the parasite and work out uh, if it's really true. But these are experiments where, in a preliminary fashion, we have, have the red blood cell, we're tracking this parasite, exploring the trajectories and trying to see uh, what type of uh, mean square displacement versus time curve we would get uh, for the parasites. The, the one result we could get from, from this sort of kind of automated video, so by, by this time we'd grown to having 
a few hundred um, uh, kind of aggress and invasion uh, videos. We, we called invasion phenotypes, and th this excited uh, at least our biological collaborators who um, who didn't know about these numbers. Well, nobody had these numbers before before anybody measured them. Um, so we could we could by basically by analyzing videos of aggress and and what happens to to all the parasites, uh, which ones invade and how long they take. Uh, we, we could work out um, th these sort of uh, histograms. So this one is the number of invasion events um, that, that we see uh, as a function of uh, the time between uh, wh when the parasite has come out and, and wh when it invades. So wh what's interesting here is <clears throat> that there's a, there's a peak and it happens uh, between uh, one, one and two minutes, so 120 seconds here, and, and this tails off. So it doesn't tail off because all the parasites invade, uh, invade the red blood cells nearby. There are still parasites that are doing Brownian motion and haven't, uh, haven't found uh, a cell yet. The, the reason why it tails off is more interesting. It, it's due to the fact that a parasite that has been outside the red blood cell for more than two minutes becomes um, less sticky and, and much less able once stuck to, to go in. And this is a more sophisticated um, uh, indication that the, the proteins that are required for invasion are, are being passivated. So probably molecules from, from, the, from the blood are, are sticking to them, or, or those proteins are not expressed by the, the little parasites anymore. And we don't really know which one of these two, but, but the, the, the clear result is that uh, uh, kind of an old parasite, more than two minutes old, is not able to, to invade the red blood cell. This other graph shows the number, of the, the, the invasive events um, from measuring the time from when the parasite first touches the red blood cell to when it goes in. So this is a shorter time, uh, peaked at 30 seconds. So this is the typical time that a parasite spends touching the red blood cell membrane and, and doing kind of random motions trying to get the, the point uh, towards the membrane. And, and then you can imagine if you have a, a drug or, or some sort of uh, change in, in, the, in the blood conditions, a change in osmotic pressure or something like that. You can actually uh, do these measurements and see wh which parameter is affected, and that, that might give you a good indication of what's going on on the cell. So in our various projects, <clears throat> one thing we developed um, uh, over 10 years ago now is, uh, is optical tweezers, and we've, we've used that also now in malaria. So tweezers, some of you actually work with them because uh, I've, met, I've met you already this week, um, are um, a focused laser beam. And uh, very often, one uses uh, infrared because it, the, the lasers are cheap and, uh, and the light doesn't damage cells. And uh, the, the focused laser beam will, will then cause objects with a higher refractive index to, to fall into the focus of the laser beam. And, um, and very often, the potential with which you're holding the object, I've drawn, drawn here this blue sphere, uh, resembles very much a, a spring, so a harmonic trap. But this trap is made of light, uh, and the infrared light travels through cells and, and, uh, and through liquids. So um, this uh, technology has been around um, as a mainstream technology for maybe 25 years. There's a community who is using it to to pull single molecules, and that's quite a, a kind of a specialist application. There's, a, there's another community who is using it to, to move objects about, and that's more kind of what I'm doing with that. The, it's possible to, to position a laser beam in many ways. You can steer a mirror. That's the most uh, kind of low-tech way of moving a laser beam. Um, but there are also um, little gadgets called um, acoustic optical deflectors, which are crystals where you set up at, uh, a grating by putting a, a compression wave. And that grating, you can update really fast. So you basically can change the grating spacing uh, at um, tens or hundreds of kilohertz frequency, which, which relates to moving the beam. So the grating deflects the beam. And if you're in the right focal plane, that deflection becomes a, a movement. So, so you can actually hold objects and move them about by positioning the beam where you want it. And you can do that very fast if you want to. So the first thing we'd done a few years ago with these uh, optical tweezers was to grab, grab hold of red blood cells. This here in the middle is a healthy red blood cell. There are no parasites here. And we, we grabbed it by getting two 
uh, well-defined five micron diameter uh, colloids and making them sticky with, with some, some protein and then, uh, and then that would stick to the red blood cell. The reason for, uh, you can also grab the cell directly with a beam if you want to, and actually I have some videos where we do that in a second. But the reason to do this properly through spheres is because it's possible to calibrate the laser force on the sphere really well, and that's quite easy. And once you do that, then when you pull the cell, what you see is this red cross here slightly displaced from the center uh, of, of the green beads. And here we've put a stronger trap, so there's less displacement. And from this um, difference here of where the laser is and where the bead is, we know how much force uh, we're putting uh, on in, in this axis. So, so we've calibrated on the bead. We can then stretch the cell. And, and we know uh, how strong the cell is from, from doing that experiment. So that was interesting because we, we, we actually then used this information on how strong a red blood, red blood cell is to, to get to um, information on how strongly um, malaria parasites attaches to a cell. So before I show you that, uh, we did experiments to show that we weren't killing uh, the, the, the malaria parasites by, by having these optical beams uh, in the system. So, so this is just images uh, where we grabbed a parasite, took it to a cell, uh, waited uh, a bit, uh, a little bit more than a minute, and this parasite, you can see here, is sticking to the cell. It's even causing, it to, causing the cell to do um, quite large deformations, and then it's gone in, and the cell is, is very deformed for a bit, um, which is something that happens almost all the time when parasites, parasites invade cells. And this is a video of those same, same frames. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to start. Should start. Right. So this is th this we've trapped with the beam, and we're we're going to move it there. And then, then the video speeds up. Right, it has less pure frames, um, and the parasite has got has gone in. Yeah. So the star shape is called a kinocytic shape. Um, you can even get to it if you drink enough beers. So if you, if, you <laughs> if you go to the bar and drink, a lot of your blood cells will actually look like that, quite dramatic, uh, spiky shape. Can we do this as a hands-on session? Yeah, we can. <laughs> but, but we also, <laughs> I then need to get some blood from each of you and um, <clears throat> take it to the microscope. Um, OK, so the shape of a red blood cell is a delicate balance of the phospholipids and how they bend, and the cytoskeleton just inside that has some tension. And, uh, and you can upset it by alcohol or, or temperature in many ways. And uh, the, when, the, when these parasites invade, they unbalance the calcium levels, and uh, they unbalance this, uh, this balance of the bending of the phospholipids and the tension from the cytoskeleton, and this, the cells go that shape for a little bit. And then the pumps. That, that balance all these ions uh, regulate it again, and after a few minutes, that shape goes back to normal, but the parasite is inside. But no, the blobs are, um, I mean, uh, no, there are no, those blobs don't correspond to clumps of molecules. Uh, it's, really, um, it's really a mechanics problem. It's like the structure has a, a, a resistance to bending, but a tension inside. And it does an instability between being the biconcave shape and being this uh, kind of starry uh, shape. And um, it has to be true because it's been reproduced in numerical simulations as well by just simple balance of tension and bending. OK, so, so we, we can use the, the elasticity of a cell uh, almost as a calibrated, um, calibrated spring. Uh, and so because if we, if we pull the cell, we get force versus uh, pulling, and it's quite linear. So I could spend a lot of time on this because, uh, because we wrote entire papers on this. And, uh, and in fact, it's, it's much less trivial than just being, um, being a linear spring. So if you start changing the rate at which you pull, this is a material uh, which is nonlinear and, and has a very complicated uh, rheology. But if you fix the pulling rates and, and you go slowly, then it does behave like a, like, like apparently like a linear thing. And provided you don't change the rates, you can trust this, uh, this line to give you a stiffness. Uh, and, and you can use it as a, you can use the elongation of the cell 
to report on the force that you're actually uh, measuring on a system. So what we did here then was to use the elongation of cell to tell us about uh, forces. And we created, um, so we couldn't really bring colloids here. So, so that's why we had to rely on the, kind of this calibration of the red blood cell. So we've got a, a laser beam pulling the cell from here. This cell is attached to the glass. And here in the middle is a parasite. So now you can see it again. So um, the parasite is sticking to both cells. We're, we're pulling this one. And then at some point it detaches. So this we did uh, on, on many similar situations. So again, cell is stuck. There was a par parasite in the middle. So, so we, we actually assemble. So, so Alex uh, took a cell, found a parasite, got it to stick, and then brought the cell with the stuck parasite to another cell, and then pulled away. And this, this he could do um, on ten, tens of cells. So then what he measured was the elongation of the cell being pulled uh, at the moment of, of detachment. So there are lots of problems on this. I mean, and, and if you're experts on, um, on pulling molecules, then uh, I mean, you can complain, you can ask me kind of nasty questions. Um, because, <laughs> because essentially what we're measuring is a, a first passage time problem. So we should be really careful about uh, the rate at which we're pulling and, and a, a lot of complications. But, but you should also realize this is the first time anybody has ever put a, any sort of number on, on this uh, parasite sticking. And also, there are other obvious consequences of uh, what you see here, such as the fact that the parasite sticks on both ends. And also, these are, uh, these are uh, old parasites, because it does take us more than two minutes to go and get them. So these, are, these parasites remain, remain sticky after they're, they're not invasive anymore. Yeah? Um, so what you're measuring is actually the stickiness of the weak side, right? You said it's polarized. Yeah, so if, if it's still polarized after two minutes, which nobody knows, then we'd be measuring the weak side. Uh, my suspicion is that after two minutes, it's actually lost that clever gradient of adhesion, and so it will probably be more uniform. So we're measuring a number which is 40 plus or minus 8 uh, piconewtons. Um, so this number should be probably put in context of other numbers of um, ligand receptor interactions. Uh, the, the biggest and strongest of everything is biotin streptavidin at 160. This is kind of the super glue of biology. Uh, this won't be broken by thermal forces in any way. And, and it's used also in, uh, in nanoscience a lot to, to create constructs. Um, there are much, much weaker uh, ligand interaction uh, uh, forces, such as the binding between actin and myosin that takes place in muscles. That's at 1.7 piconewtons. And so this 40, we don't really know if it's coming from many weak ones or uh, a few more specific uh, protein, uh, protein interactions uh, from the parasite to the cell. So this is kind of all still to be explored. We could also start putting some drugs and, and seeing what happens. And we tried three, um, <coughs> three very kind of classical uh, approaches. This, this heparin is a, is a blood thinner. It does, it does stop uh, all sorts of adhesions. It stops red blood cells from, from clumping with each other. But, and it does stop the parasite from invading, but it's not a good drug because uh, it will kill people before, uh, before it actually affects the parasite sticking. Um, chymotrypsin is, um, is a molecule which is also used uh, currently as a drug. It stops some of the interactions between uh, surface proteins and, uh, and red blood cell uh, proteins. Um, but it only, it's not 100% effective, and, and uh, it only aff it affects some types of, of falciparum more than others. So it's not the, it's not the final, kind of, uh, final good drug for everything. This cytokalase in D is a molecule which uh, is well known in molecular biology. It stops the uh, actin myosin uh, motors from working. So there's a stage in the invasion where this, this parasite uh, deploys a molecular motor to actually uh, exert forces and, and uh, tunnel into the, into the red blood cell cytoskeleton uh, and, and membrane. That happens here. So, so this was interesting to see if things got stuck there. So, so we could measure um, the forces. I told you there was a 40 in, in the normal condition, the wild type. And, uh, and uh, heparin uh, reduces dramatically that 40 down to less than 10. So the, the, the sticking really goes down. 
The other two drugs uh, reduce the sticking a tiny bit, but, but not that much. And there's an effect of, uh, especially the cytokalazin, on, um, on, the, on the percentage of, of parasites that, uh, that adhere at later times. So if we look at uh, fresh parasites before three minutes of regression and after three minutes of regression, uh, these three drugs, uh, at the fresh parasites still stick, but the, the older parasites don't stick here. Again, we don't know, and our biology uh, collaborators are excited, but they don't really know either why, why this would happen. This, um, I think we, we can stick, well, well, I have a video on this, so, which is more interesting. Th th this was interesting because we, we, we spent some time looking at these uh, older parasites, and the fact that they still were sticking um, was, was interesting. Uh, and also the fact that they, they don't just stick, but they're able to, to make big deformations on, uh, on the red blood cells that they, that they target. So I think this is more obvious in the video. So at the moment, we're holding this parasite with the tweezers, so it says on. And then at some point, we, we let go. It will say off. Uh, yeah, off. And this parasite sticks, and it causes kind of these big waves, and the, the cell is in kind of folding on, on itself uh, a bit. So th those are movements that uh, a cell by itself will never do. It will never kind of fold up on itself li like that from, from just uh, random fluctuations. <coughs> so so we're, we're quite keen to, to explore this because to, to actually, for a parasite to cause those deformations, either it's the fact that it's a pair, a very sticky pair, that, that causes uh, adhesion and, and the cell folds up a bit. That could be one of, the, one of the ways in which that's happening. Or it could be even more active. It could be pumping calcium into the cytoskeleton of the cell. That calcium could cause contractions of the, of the essentially actin of the cytoskeleton, and those contractions could be folding the cell. But whichever of these, of, of these two ways, it's very obvious that the parasite is, is causing red blood cell deformations. And those deformations uh, clearly increase the chance of the apical part of the parasite coming into contact with the membrane. Um, that's the part where the, I think the physics and the mechanics uh, come together with uh, what the biologists know about the specific proteins, and, uh, and you actually have to come up with a unified description of, of, of the process. OK, my, my last slide is just to say that this, um, I mean, for me, working with this host pathogen required learning uh, as much as possible about the, the biology side, but, but the te techniques were, were actually quite simple. We, we had the microscope, we had the tweezers, and we just tried to use them in a way that would uh, give some interesting information for the biologists. <coughs> Keeping in mind, we also knew a bit about the, the membranes and the mechanics of the membranes, and so in the back of my mind, I had the idea that I might even use uh, some of the physics uh, as well as just giving numbers to the biologists. And um, <coughs> turns out, that this idea of looking at uh, pathogens and hosts <coughs> is incredibly important in, uh, in a lot of um, infectious disease work. And so as soon as we started working on one problem, we had a lot of biologists coming to ask whether we could look at their favorite um, host and pathogen. So, um, so we did some work also with um, uh, Salmonella, which is one of the biggest uh, food, um, uh, food pathogens worldwide. Uh, it's a bacterium, whereas uh, falciparum that I spoke about up to now is a eukaryote, so a much more sophisticated organism. Bacterium is quite simple, uh, but, but interesting in many ways. And this bacterium interacts um, with cells of our immune system, macrophage cells, that it finds uh, aligning uh, the gut. So, so here we, um, we again used our, our microscopes and, and quantified um, adhesion times. This is a distribution of how long uh, the, the, the contacts are between uh, bacteria and, and macrophage cells. And uh, it's kind of a Poisson distribution, but then a, a long tail here. That, that those, those, these, are, these long events uh, describe some different interaction between the bacterium and the, the cell, which is not, not random and probably leads to some of these bacteria actually being able to enter the cell. So the, these red ones here are bacteria which are not stuck on the outside, they're actually inside the cell, which we can tell by scanning in Z. So this also essentially gave us uh, kind of phenotypes of, of this host pathogen interaction. And perhaps interestingly, for people looking at 
motile bacteria, the, the same bacterium, but just with the mutations that affected how strongly it swims, uh, gave rise to, to different uh, invasion, uh, uh, well, di different distributions for contact times and also and, and different uh, capacity for, for invading cells. So, okay, I think uh, time to conclude. <coughs> I showed you some um, bit of automation used on a, on a biological problem. I showed you um, how we use the optical tweezers in a fairly simple way, but to get a number that, that nobody had measured before. And um, I explained to you a little bit about why I'm excited to look at the malaria parasites. Let me drink before I finish concluding. <coughs> We're hoping to, um, to scale up the experiment I showed you so far is, uh, is partially automated, but to, to make kind of a, a generation jump and, um, and, and really be able to screen drugs, we would want to measure at least 10 times more cells, uh, ideally hun hundreds more in, in the same kind of time. And to do that, we, we actually have to move to, to microfluidics. So the current PhD student, Yan Chun, is, is trying to scale down everything I showed you into, into channels so that we can mix parasites with uh, with fresh cells, and, and, and we can have a piece of the a piece of the lab on chip um, device, basically full of the infected cells and generating lots of parasites, which we can then downstream mix with the uh, fresh cells. If we if we crack that, then we, we'll really be able to to screen uh, drugs in a, in a systematic fashion, uh, and not just uh, do the qualitative measurements I've showed you up to here. Because the red thing says it's important to, to look at single cell observations. Um, that, that's, I think, uh, generally very true. And um, a lot of, kind of molecular and cell biology has reached uh, a good understanding today by looking at populations. Um, but a huge amount of detail is, uh, is hidden in uh, what each cell is doing. So in biology, it's, it's very often not true that, that the population is, uh, is a good representative for everyone. There's, uh, there's very often outliers, uh, and those outliers very often are doing a, quite a critical job inside the population. Also, inside the population, you will have young and old cells. That, that's a very basic fact, but those young and old cells will behave differently to each other. So to actually go from the type of measurements you can do in a population, which have a big error because they mix young and old, to a better understanding, you've, you've actually got to follow individual cells and know what they are in their own cell cycle. So, so this really brings in uh, microscopy and, and very often uh, ideas from microfluidics and structures. They, they don't need to be very expensive ideas. They, they, you, you just need to um, understand uh, which, which problems might really benefit from, from a closer look. And then uh, gear up some sort of automated fashion to, to still have enough data. From, from looking at single cells, because that's what you lose when you move from a big beaker with millions of cells to a situation where you're trying to follow each one. You don't, you don't want to be looking at too few cells. My second and last conclusion is, um, goes back to why I chose this project. So uh, I spoke about it last year, and I said I hadn't managed to fund it. Well, we've had two more attempts since last year, and it's still not funded, uh, but I'm still going to stick with it. Um, oh, there is one PhD student working on it, so I have to support her at least. Um, it's very difficult to, to fund this uh, in the UK and probably uh, in any of the Western countries, because even though there's a good network of biologists who like the project, when it then goes to the funding agencies, it competes with diseases that are killing people in that country. And that, that's where it then fails, uh, because it competes against cancer and uh, and diabetes and, uh, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's a specific problem that, that I have. Uh, I, I guess it points to the fact that if, if you were to be working on a problem of local interest, then it would be much easier to, to find money for, for, for that problem. But uh, on the other hand, there, there, are, there are positives, which are the reason I want to keep trying with this. Uh, it's really an area where I can see that um, the, the things I know how to do, when, when I say I, I mean, now kind of my group knows how to do, are, um, are things that we know, but, but the biologists that, that work on this problem don't know and, and wouldn't be able to do 
even if we kind of gave them uh, templates, uh, they would still need, need help. And um, uh, so, so that really is a definition of an area where you can make progress that, that hasn't been made before. And um, that's important when you, when you choose a problem. The, the techniques that we use are new. That also often defines good areas. So things you've heard this week, from anything from uh, image, automated image analysis, the power of computers, power of image analysis, um, cameras, uh, microfluidics, all of those things are fairly new. They've only come into being affordable in the last few years, and, uh, and, they, and they can really help. Uh, it's a project that has uh, an obvious importance in applications. Uh, if, if anything useful were to come with this, it would actually directly affect people, and that, that's, that, that's a good motivation for, for choosing a problem. And, um, and students, who, who are very often very intelligent people, understand the things above, and so, so there's no problem actually attracting people to, to work on this problem. And um, I told you there's this specific problem of dollars or pounds, um, but it's, it's, it's just a problem that the disease is not, is not uh, so relevant uh, in, in the rich countries. Um, I'll come back to some of these points. On, on Monday, I've been asked to, to have a discussion on career development, and so some of these things I'll, I'll come back to. And thank you very much for listening to me.